the American suburb. It is so bland that being home in the suburbs drains almost all the inspiration from my mind and saps the vitality from my blood. Hundreds of thousands of very similar looking homes lined up with well manicured white picket fences. The only community interaction is in the War of Lawn signs. Is the homeowner a MAGA freak or an overtuned, out of touch liberal? Look at the signs. The houses themselves can be beautiful until the markets crash or the biggest employer leaves town. Then people will have no choice but to move and they will rot. McMansion or luxury villa. The newest incarnation of suburban design where I live is rows upon rows of white houses wrapped around each other in labyrinthine corridors, complete with an artificial lake and golf course. We have constructed the Elysian fields of late capitalism. The suburban neighborhood, like the American dream, is utterly devoid of any soul, drenched in irony, and deficient in availability to minorities. Nonetheless, some 80% of Americans dream of home ownership, and the white picket fence is still considered to be the American ideal. I'm not going to investigate precisely why that is. To me, it seems to be a melange of the post-war need for housing, corporate dealings, and popular culture, and racism. Today, I'm more interested in the subtle abnormalities of suburban life the subconscious of the American environment. You see, despite their banality, the suburban and small town neighborhoods of America have been stages for surreal art and media for decades. Gregory Crutzen's Twilight is a photo book comprised of his photos from 1998 to 2002. He shoots tableau, static scenes containing actors and models. In Twilight, he takes suburban scenes and twists them, bringing out their uncanniness and truth. Crutzen belongs to a more cinematic photography school than documentary or street photography. His photography, like documentary photography, is sometimes done on site. However, he isn't in the small towns of western Massachusetts to document them. He arranges a set on location that is less like a photo studio and more like a small movie production. And speaking of movie productions, if you've seen Ari Aster's Hereditary or Midsommar, some of the scenes here are going to be familiar to you. Supernatural elements like demons, mysterious lights, peculiar model houses, and regular people a la nude. This photo book has all of that, mi minus the devils. Twilight, the transition between day and night, when the sky turns violet and the lights of homes flick on one by one, dotting the landscape with tiny, equidistant lanterns, has always been thought of as a time of ambiguity, purgatory. The world is going into a stage of hibernation. And suppose that sleep is a sneak peek at oblivion. In that case, twilight is the comatose, narcotics-fueled visions as we slip over the brink on our hospital beds. The total memories of our years on Earth are collapsing headfirst into our vulnerabilities and unfulfilled wishes. And sometimes these visions may be direct. One photo in Twilight is from the frame of a window looking out onto the street where one of the telephone poles has become overgrown with flowers and is illuminated. A person is climbing up to some unknowable height, like Jack and the Beanstalk. And whether we like our surroundings or not, they become intimately familiar. We cannot recall memories of experiencing the infinite vastness of space, nor even that of the hundreds of thousands of small communities that we will never be able to join for tea. We can only conjure up meaning from our narrow frame of experiences, which is so inevitably impressed upon by our environment. And the form of our environment plays what role? How does a school designed to keep students under constant surveillance and control affect their activism? Or does one designed for violence affect their mentality? What problem does hostile architecture pushing homeless people further and further into invisibility solve? We have these immense neighborhoods, all these similar buildings. It is undeniably luxurious to live in a suburb. But then why are our feelings so muted? Maybe it's influenced by our suburban environment. Maybe not. But that's what I see in Crudson's photos. Individual pictures in Twilight are not easily parsable. However, there is a palette of motifs that appears continually, and they serve to represent our fears, anxieties, and they capture a certain abstract horror. One example is mysterious lights, sometimes coming from the sky or other places where one would not expect them. They appear from a porta potty, the sewer, in a shed at night. Flowers, butterflies, and a preoccupation with what lies below the floors of your suburban home, vehicles, windows, and coyotes all appear constantly. 
And a lot is going on in these motifs. So I'm gonna choose my battles and start by discussing the fixation on what is below us. A teenage boy removes the drainage pipe of his shower and reaches his arm deep into the unknown. A man is on his hands in the middle room of his house as lights burst through his floor. Another man has completely excavated the foundation of his bedroom. A tree is suspended above the hole. This seems like the discovery of what the American way of life is built on. While we are still maturing, the machinations of our world are hidden from our sight. But curiosity drives us to understand, and so we dig. These are not chronological photos of one individual's journey, but instead feels akin to a vignette of each person's experience. One of the most telling is an older woman lying on the carpet floor of her middle room. No disgust or pleasure is visible on her face, but she looks contemplative. On the carpet is a rectangular cutout, removed so that you can see the pipes, the undergirding of society, and then neatly put back into place. Another one of my favorite motifs is that of mounds of things. A particularly interesting one is the Wonder Bread Stonehenge, as I call it. It reconstructs the image of something so typical in American life, mass-produced, life-shredding food, and reconstructs it into the abstract. It forces the audience to reflect on what it considers to be normal. Are the forms around us so dull and immutable? Or is it by our world's very design that we are supposed to feel that way? To believe that nothing more is possible? Or yet that there is no greater truth? Another one of these constructs is a pile of dirt. More covered in flowers than the most gorgeous spring field, it appears in the middle of a street, in a backyard, between two buildings, and in the garage. There's also a woman, wearing a nightgown, she's surrounded by flowers as she sits on her knees on the floor of her kitchen. Her curly black hair is pulled back messily into a ponytail, and there's a glimmer of sweat at the base of her neck. And despite her verdant surroundings, she carries a deeply morose look on her face. And most of the women appearing in Twilight emit that aura. They're often naked, presented in a way that shows everything, but is utterly sexless. It almost feels as if the nudity of these regular women is a rebuke of the self-empowerment commercial, featuring a supermodel directing you to be yourself. It also speaks to what women feel in a habitat in which they are subjected to utterly different stressors than men. Pregnancy, objectification, body image, and general dissatisfaction with domestic life are all visible in the photos in which they appear. Let's talk a little bit about the photographer. Gregory Crudson was born and raised in the Park Slope neighborhood of Brooklyn, which is somewhat ironic given his subjects. He's the son to a psychoanalyst, who he decided to follow in the footsteps of, but was troubled in school so it didn't work out. He dated a photographer at one point and developed a love for the art. He noted that in his photography classes at Yale, they taught a documentarian style of photography, where practitioners try to find a poetic truth in the world around them. But influenced by Deanne Arbus's exposition and the construct-busting works of New York's Cindy Sherman and Laurie Simmons, he gravitated towards a more median style. There was also Blue Velvet, a David Lynch film that informed Crudson's cinematic style. It helped him conceptualize images of, quote, Americans living lives of quiet desperation. Now, Crudson shoots his photos on a large format film, but he does not man the camera himself. He prefers to stand to the side of it, where he can experience the scene as a whole and direct the actors more simply. The large format style and scale of the scenes make the actors feel small, which just increases the lonely uncanniness of it all. And Crudson's photography has won various awards. He's currently a professor at Yale School of Art. Crudson's photos are a melancholic vision of American life, where we are constantly under the influence of our environment, disenfranchised and disempowered. Twilight comes complete with beautiful, sullen imagery and enough depth to keep you invested in the pictures for a long time. If you're interested in purchasing Twilight or Crudson's other photo books, then you can find copies of them for sale on Amazon or used copies on eBay. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like and subscribe. This has been Drew Waddell. Have a good one.